generative AI, conversational AI, robotics, automation. It's going to just completely take away some jobs, completely enhance some other jobs. If you're coming out as an HR expert, it's really important now to understand how these technologies are impacting your job. Because now you can do your job better as a result of it. If you're a doctor coming in, it's mandatory that they understand technology around it. So it's a non-negotiable and it's a continuously evolving process that we are constantly getting better as a result of it. Everything coming together, we all kind of want to curate, right, at the end of the day, which I think brings us to kind of IoT, whether it's a smart home, smart city, wherever you go, the whole power of AI or AR VR comes together when everything's connected. everyone and welcome to Seashless by Echelon and today we are looking at how technology affects human behavior and joining me are three experts in the field, uh, good friends I would say. Um, Chandi Dharmanathan is the Chief People Officer of Axiata Digital Labs. Dilmini Veragama is the Group CEO of Rockland Distilleries in a brand new role and Sanjeev Palihavadana, all hand in technology, is the Chief Operating Officer at Mitra. Welcome to all three of you. Technology affects all our lives from the moment we wake up, I think, you know, till we uh, to go to sleep and, and, and if you wear all these um, uh, apps and, and technology, um, fitness trackers, you'll, even when you're asleep, it, it's with you. Um, out of all the technologies out there, and this is to all three of you, um, which ones do you think will affect human behavior uh, going forward? Is it just AI, which is the buzzword today? Or is there others out there that may, you know, are still in relevant or maybe make a comeback as well? What do you think? Yeah, so I think AI definitely will play a big role. But if you just take a step back, I think uh, the revolution in terms of technology driving human behavior started long ago. But most recently, you know, during COVID-19, you know, we really saw a sea change in, in behavior, right? With remote working tools, et cetera. But now I think as we speak, there is another big revolution going on with AI uh, that's going to transform behavior in so many ways, uh, not just in the workplace, but also in any social setting. Uh, in the workplace, it's going to completely transform the way we do things. Uh, generative AI, conversational AI, robotics, automation, it's going to just just completely take away some jobs, completely enhance some other jobs. While on the other hand, you know, from a social point of view, as you said at the beginning, you know, uh, social media is already making a change. And since we're talking about gender uh, influence, etc., you know, I, I personally have seen how uh, social media has impacted the reduction of gender bias to a great extent. And even to the extent where, you know, non-binary genders are now accepted in, in Gen Z, I would have imagined that it would have taken generations to happen uh, if not for social media so so many things are changing wearables audio you know ar vr uh, augmented reality virtual reality robotics I, I i i guess we are not too far away from a world where you know people are going to be living with with humanoids and and virtual pets so yeah things are going to be interesting in the next few years and it, any other technologies that you think? Will I mean, work? picking on uh, AR and VR, I think, uh, I mean, it's fascinating, right? The way it's changing life in general. On one side, it really gives you the experiential kind of outlook, whether it's buying a shoe or clothes or painting your house. You now know what it looks like before you purchase it. But I think there is a much deeper impact that it's making. If you look at surgeons around, humans are no more the guinea pigs, right? You now have a kind of preempt to what you're doing. You can trial, test, and make sure that you don't you know, minimize the damage that you make. And I think it goes across industries. So I think AR, VR for sure, I think is gonna change behavior and kind of enhance lifestyles. And I do think that everything coming together, we all kind of wanna curate, right, at the end of the day, um, which I think brings us to kind of IoT whether it's a smart home, smart city, wherever you go, the whole power of AI or AR, VR comes together when everything's connected. So when they talk to each other, and I think kind of it enhances lifestyle as a whole. So, you know, and what's interesting is all of us are talking of the technologies that we know now, 
And it's not too long ago when these words were not buzzwords. So potentially if we meet again in less than six months, there'll probably Absolutely. be a new word that we don't even know today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so I agree with all the uh, points made. And at the same time, I think, uh, so obviously AI and seeing the advancement of AI itself, like with generative AI, uh, humanoids and robots coming in, um, and also going into the industries like healthcare, for example, making an operation less invasive. So helping humans in that way. And then you take, I mean, even there's, there's this robot that I saw a video clip who goes and cleans the toilet, right? And then you have this, another robot, a vacuum cleaner, and then you have self-driving cars, and then you have recently launched a software engineer robot called Devin, who does the job of a software engineer. So you see it constantly evolving to be even smarter, even better, and actually with more data and more time, because robots also learn constantly and it becomes better. So you can see the advancement of it impacting even more with more accuracy and more precisiveness. So obviously it's gonna impact all of us in every industry, whether it's HR or finance or any profession as well. And uh, we can also now see, you know, uh, roles, job descriptions for roles such as uh, prompt engineer or uh, ethics expert because all the AI coming Absolutely. in. So you see <laughs> in all these, all these things, uh, coming to life uh, during our lifetime. Uh, but what it also does is it makes everything uh, better because you're making uh, better decisions as a result of it. You're able to impact human lives as a result of it. And you're able to uh, constantly progress in any industry. Like if you're coming out as an HR expert, it's really important now to understand how these technologies are impacting your job. Because now you can do your job better as a result of it. If you're a doctor coming in, it's mandatory that they understand technology around it. So it's a non-negotiable and it's a continuously evolving process that we're constantly getting better as a result of it. Whether you're an uh, employee, you're having a better service. If you're a professional, you're having a better way of doing things. If you're a consumer, you're having better services as a result of it. So definitely integrating into us and helping all of us. It's, it's funny, you think it's, it's a scary time to be a human, but it's actually an exciting time to be a human, right? Absolutely. Historical generations will look at us with jealousy, more than fear. We are living through it, there's some fear as well. But I think there's a thin line between that, right? Yeah, absolutely, uh, that's, that's the scary part. I remember recently I was having a chat with a friend who has a virtual child and his wow. own kids were kind of saying, can you spend you know, 20% of that money on us maybe? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, it's an investment and it's, it's probably what life's gonna be, but as I said, it's a thin line. <laughs> Very thin line. And then I think uh, eventually you're gonna have these uh, virtual kids have rights. And yeah, then, you know, and that, that <laughs> opens up the whole Pandora's box of, of ethical and other issues. As well. And soon these virtual kids will be real physical beings oh, and that's yeah. when it's kind of really <laughs> that's absolutely, when it's absolutely, scary. absolutely but it's about time no we had some competition for the uh, real <laughs> human kids spoiled brats and you know they, they have uh, virtual kids that improve with every interaction incredible times incredible times it, there's a thin line between um, what, what's going on now and and and, and the impact and i think people are worried and i think uh, one way to address those, that worry is to sort of give them some direction in how this will impact uh, you know us uh, so I'm going to start with you, Chandra, because you're into the space um, of managing people. Um, that's where I think a lot of the fear is. Um, I don't think the technology starts too worried, but I think the people are worried. Um, and and uh, talking to many people in, in, in your field, um, they obviously don't have the exposure you do. In a sense, you've been in uh, managing people in two large technology companies. Um, they build exciting products. And therefore, uh, you know, you have exposure to the kind of things that they're doing. Um, you know, what advice can you give to people who are not really from that, uh, not that you're from the technological background as well, but uh, you are managing ex people who are doing exciting things with technology. Uh, what advice can you give to those who are worried, um, you know, about this um, from, from your background? Yeah, so I think I was lucky enough to work uh, in companies that had really good processes and really smart people where we learned from uh, about these technological advancements at a very early stage. Um, so my advice is number one, uh, you got to have your basics in place. 
right? Your hydro retire process, uh, basics like your competency frameworks, job description, so basic structures, basic things done have to be in place. After that, you know, hire to retire process, recruitment, how do you do that uh, using technology? What is the employee experience that you want to give as a result of using technology? You need to be really clear about it. So it has to go with the company values, how, what kind of a company you are at, so you give that experience. And how do you use technology to do that? Um, and then you go on to the onboarding process. How do you use technology in that space? Um, when you are doing your employee engagement, how do you use technology to do that? And also how you use data analytics. Uh, how do you capture what kind of data do you want to capture? So you understand what kind of service do you need to do or what kind of data you want to have? How do you use that for predictive analytics to see if in the IT industry, I think one of the biggest uh, things that we have is employee retention. Absolutely. So then employee retention, a really good tool would be uh, AI-based predictive analytics system. But to do that, you need to have your basics because you need to understand what data, why are people getting disengaged, why are people engaged? And once you understand that from your high to retire process, you do certain surveys, you have certain data, and then you can go and make sure that you use that data to you know, proactively retain people. Or if you go on to your promotion process, uh, which we have done in certain companies, and as it were to serve, we used to do this, where is you're looking at certain criteria for a promotion. Uh, for example, maybe it is a certain tenure you need to be in, certain uh, um, kind of trainings you need to have prior to it, certain kind of stretch roles you need to play. Um, so you look at all of that data and you can have uh, technology kind of putting on a list of people. These are the people who are ready for it. And then more an analytics to predict which ones based on their criticality mm -hmm. should we look at as our first round of promotions. So, and job rotations, I mean, uh, internal fulfillment, uh, all that is possible, but your foundation has to be there. You need to have a system to get the data. You need to have a really good understanding of what you're trying to achieve with the data. Otherwise, it's garbage in, garbage out. Exactly, exactly. I think because you can get the systems bespoke or you can get it from outside. And either way, the systems are available for everyone to use. I think your point is very critical. I think it's, it's, it's the data and what you want to do with it is what everybody needs to get, right? And that's what they usually don't know. They go and buy fanciful systems. They don't know what they want to do with the system. So I think that's a very important point. I think just Please. to add to what Chandi said, that one of the biggest challenges that, that people in HR and in management in general will have in this day and age with you know remote working and all of that is to maintain organizational culture and values, like you said, in this remote working environment, right? How do you do, do that using technology? I, I don't think a lot of people have cracked that. We haven't cracked it either. But I think that's one big ticket item that a lot of us will have to start thinking about because I personally feel that culture is eroding uh, because people are completely remote and that's going to be the challenge uh, in hand right now for many of us. Yes. I'm going to add a point Please. to that. I read this Gartner report, the Gartner Trends for HR in 2023, and one resonates really well with Sanjeev. What Sanjeev said, they said 60% of your middle managers, or kind of you know lower middle managers, are now the ones who are actually the culture catalysts. Because with the remote working, people are reporting to them. A larger, a larger number of people are actually reporting to them. So they kind of set what is the culture, how do we work here, how do you talk to people, how... So therefore, making sure that middle level has the right values and all of that, plus, I mean, how do you do that? You can only do that by having the right systems in place. I mean, your training, here's what we want to do, here's the culture. You've got to have technology driving that agenda, your promotions, your evaluations, everything. So. It's, uh, it's critical that you have that layer powered to be that catalyst. Interesting. One of the things that have changed, uh, we've talked a lot about, you know, the uh, putting together the teams and the talent, and, uh, which is critical, but it's also the consumer. We're trying to f 
look at your whole profile of, of where you worked and stuff like that. And one thing that I've noticed is that you have a massive exposure to supply chains. Um, and, and supply chains gives uh, initially, uh, you know, um, idea of how consumer tastes are changing and I, whether it's COVID or, you know, whether it's, uh, I think before that, you know, e-commerce is just taking off and stuff like that. Um, what have you seen, um, you know, in terms of insights that you can share with us? You know, when you're in a manufacturing environment or supply chain or anything, actually, whether it's a product or a service for that matter, and I think uh, Jeff Bezos said it recently as well. I don't think you'll ever find a consumer coming and saying, can I please have it, uh, you know, delayed? You can take your own time. You know, I wouldn't want it in a hurry. Can I have it? Could it be a little bit more expensive? Those are never going to be <laughs> requests that come our way, right? <laughs> and what we've done to society with the Ubers, the pick of the world, is to say, look, it's at your fingertip and it can come to you faster. Right. I mean, look at Amazon, right? We go in and get Amazon Prime because you want fast delivery. But even under Amazon Prime, you want to go and say same day delivery. Right. You always look for the same days, not even one day. And what that has done to us is absolutely made us impatient. Right. Think about your kids. Oh, actually, think about marketing. You don't even spend money on YouTube clips anymore because you don't watch it. Why? Because our attention span has now gone down from a YouTube clip to a YouTube reel. Right? So the only thing that will work today is a TikTok or a YouTube reel. But what does it tell us about the consumer is absolute impatience, right? It's about the attention span that they have. So may it be the speed of delivery that they need, which trickles down to the speed of production, speed of the entire value chain, speed of design, speed of innovation. It's about being able to get something out faster, better, cheap at the end of the day. And the other thing I feel is that, you know, with technology or oh, with social media, right? Now you know what's out there, right? Those days, it'll probably be your neighbor or your friends or your family, and you see what they have and you say, oh, I can compare with what my friends have. But today your comparison is global. And it's actually not even just comparison and awareness. Um, you now have your reviews. I mean, how, I'm sure you guys have done this, right? You go and buy something in a store. Before you purchase it, stand in there, right there. You go online and you check the reviews on it. And you can read five, six different people around the globe telling you what their experience was. So no more are you blind to it. Now you're aware of the quality standards. What does that mean? You become more demanding. But no more is a consumer blind to what they should expect from a product or a service, right? So I think what that does to an industry or all of us as professionals is to understand that there's impatience across and there's absolute demand in terms of personalization customization and really getting the best value for their money. So I think that's that's a bigger shift that I've seen in the past few years. But, you know, obviously it's interesting because when you say consumer, your it's not just the consumer of your products, right? Your customer is also your internal customer. And you guys were talking about in terms of HR, your generational shift that's happening. And we're talking about the generation that's now working that was caught in, you know, COVID and working externally or remotely. But imagine the kids who studied remotely. Imagine the influence on their mindset, right? These guys are coming into the workforce in the next 10 years. What they expect and what that is going to create as human behavior is going to be, you know, we don't even understand it right now. So I think it's an interesting shift that's happening. Uh, it's a shift that we probably need to be aware of and kind of adapt to so that you don't get left behind. I'm just going to ask a follow up to that as well. Um, uh, I think plenty of statistics uh, sort of describe the fact that um, females decide, make a lot of uh, spending decisions now more than ever. I think I think it's a common sense before, but now I think it's 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 a uh, you know the the reach is much higher in terms of the, the decision making and and exactly because they have tools that they didn't have before. Yeah. Do you think that that the the the, the companies sort of factor this in or I mean is that now something consciously in in, uh, in the offerings that are being produced? You know I think it's an age old. <laughs> kind of thought that goes around, especially in demand planning, <laughs> to say the influences of purchase is always a woman, right? But it's interesting because, so at Unilever as well as Hamas, mm. Atlas, the exposure that I've had, uh, you know, it's quite different. So in that wide range of the different ways that we looked at the market and the way we would analyze consumer purchasing behavior, gender influence on it was always very subjective based on the products. 
right? I don't think it's a blanket statement anymore to say, hey, it's the female of the household that shops, because that's what it was. What it was was that the man brings in the money and the woman takes it and goes and shops because you have the time to do it, right? I'm, I'm not saying that's changed completely. And I think a majority of the households, it would still be the female that kind of purchases the requirements for the house. But I think there's also a shift that's happening um, subject to the category that you're talking about, right? There is a lot of influence that the women make now because we are, I mean, there's more women in the workforce. And they're earning more. The, exactly. You now have expendable income, but also you are aware of what's out there. Before it was about a list of things that you would need for the house. No more is it a need. Now you can actually create impulse buying. Now there's social media that's influencing. Now there are influencers that they want to follow, <laughs> right? And there are, you know, color designs that you want to kind of set the trend with. So do I think there's a gender bias there? Absolutely. <laughs> if there's designs that influence men versus females, I'm not saying all, but majority would you know, obviously be steered towards following it and having the design re you know, requirement or wanting to be, I mean, they all bug us, right? To say, well, if you get something free, if there's a bundle pack, you'll find most of the mothers going in and purchasing it and saying, oh, I got a really good deal because something comes free of charge. Now, is that gender based or not? I don't know. But, you know, I do feel that there is an element that companies have learned over the years to go from a blanket statement of saying females purchase to understanding what categories are more influenced by which gender versus which, you know, person in the family, really. I, I think the appreciation needs to see that uh, I think in this country, at least the appreciation that there is a, the, the earning power um, the shift, I, I still don't think that it's really factored in. We'll see. It's an interesting conversation to have. Um, Sanjeev, I'm going to come to you because I, I think out of all of us, you, you've been the person that has been, more, been making a lot of the tech products for a long period of time, right? Um, and so you've seen the evolution of how these products are made, how, how the kind of decision making in relation to it has happened. Um, you know, have you seen interactions uh, between humans and these tech products change over your time? Um, what are the ones that stand out for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think back in the day, 25 years ago, when we started, it used to be all green screens and, you know, then it evolved into forms with fields. I think that's way in the past now, right? Now the interactions are so different. You still have inputs and outputs, but if you take inputs, for example, the inputs are now about a 360 degree view of a customer or, a, or an individual that a system interacts with. It will want to know about your habits, your behaviors, your buying patterns, you, you know, your gender, your family background, all of that in order to give you the best, best possible offering. So inputs change drastically. Outputs also have completely changed. It, it used to be just an output value on a field. Now it's, it's multi-dimensional, right? Multi-sensory, you know, it can be again in the form of augmented reality. It can be in the form of uh, voice through generative uh, conversational AI. It can be in the form of wearables. It can be in the form of AI suggesting things. So complete transformation in the in the way things are done and in the way humans interact with technology and as builders of these these platforms we have to be acutely aware of of these changes and then adapt to it interesting absolutely interesting. no i think there's a shift in how you um, you know react with technology or how you speak to technology even at a very young age now right i mean if you look at consumer versus technology for us growing up you know, shifting from a dial phone to this took time. And um, I still remember when my, for, you know, now eight year old, but when she was maybe 11 months, right? She knew how to operate all screens. You didn't have to tell them. And now if you see a two year old, current two year old, they grow up with <laughs> scrolling, <laughs> you know what I mean? And also it's no more scrolling there. So again, main difference, the, my, my two kids have probably only a three year gap. The older one still writes to search. The little one just speaks, right? Three years. Imagine the exponential shift that happens and that's how you react with technology. So your input went from writing to just speaking. She wouldn't bother because she knows that there's now voice input. It's just gonna get probably <laughs> better or worse. Question to all of you. Uh, it's being debated globally and will continue to be debated globally as well. 
tech does not really discriminate, but those people designing the technology, they discriminate, right? Whether they are writing an algorithm or the kind of uh, you know data samples that they use, discrimination has been coming in, and and, and that that is a problem, right? An example would be um, uh, I, I've read about banks um, in in even the de in the developer come you know when it comes loans to women versus how they assess income potential for men, um, minorities, facial recognition problems, all sorts of things. Um, Will tech technology, you know, contribute to, um, you know, closing the gap in terms of all sorts of discrimination in society or will it widen it? So actually, if you use it wisely and ethically, it could close the gap. But from uh, my experience in HR, I could give you an example. One is transparency mm -hmm. in how things happen. Is there as a, as a result of technology? Because if you have proper systems in your workplace, you will make sure that everything is uh, very transparently there. For example, if you're having a performance evaluation process and it's system driven, it's pretty transparent. Your KPIs are there, evaluation happens, feedback is there, development plans are done, it's transparent. Access to information is also power. So whether you are a man or a woman, if you have systems where people can go and search information about customers and all of that in a company or speak up in a company, it's transparent. Hiring. So we talk a lot about this algorithmic ways of recruitment, which makes it uh, transparent. If you keep the algorithms or the criteria that you use to hire transparent, so people know when I opt to this thing, these are the requirements that I need to have. But sometimes there is this thing called algorithmic biases. So it's very important that uh, companies make sure that they constantly look at these biases, uh, look at what the algorithms are, and keep changing it to ensure that you don't have the biases coming through that as well. Uh, but I think more or less what it does is, I mean, technology uh, gives an equal playing field for everyone, especially like Sanjeev said, uh, working from home, it gives more uh, uh, transparency, gives you more uh, access to information, so whether you are a man or a, wo man or a woman, uh, your uh, requirements to perform the job will be very clearly defined. Um, so I think it adds more into increasing diversity than decreasing it. And then there are now AI tools that can identify gender bias, for example, in all of those processes, for example, during recruitment or promotions or even pay parity. Even if there, there are inherent process biases or subjective biases, AI can identify those patterns and call it out so that you can take uh, conscious actions. And to add to that, I think overall, if you look at this whole uh, topic of bias, I think overall there are many, many things that are going on to help reduce biases. I think if you look at a lot of the NGOs, for example, uh, active things going on to use technology to to eradicate bias, you know, for women in rural areas, for example, in, in the developing world, you know, the use of technology for mobile banking to uh, give them access to new markets that either did not exist. All of those things are possible now because of uh, because of technology. Having said that, there is always a flip side and, you know, there are there's stuff like all these deep fake things that are going on. So like you guys said, if you misuse it, it can create more bias you know, within organizations and in society in general. Constant battle, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting your question because I think those who want to be discriminative will find a way, whether there's technology or not. But I, I believe right now, if you take, you know, the normal distribution and you take the majority of those who have biases, I think most are unconscious biases, right? There's only a few that are vindictive, purposeful biases. And I think that portion will, will continue irrelevant of technology. But I think the unconscious biases will now be taken care of because of the tech that you were, you know, you were speaking of. But let's forget gender for a while, right? Oh, actually, if you look at gender, especially in the manufacturing, completely narrows the gap. Because one thing that you can't debate is muscle power. There's no way a female will ever have the same muscle power that a man would. But today, automation makes it okay. 
right? There's so much digital can do that allows and brings an equal playing field in those areas, which are predominantly male dominant for reason, right? But if you take gender out, inclusiveness is a cross, right? In that sense, if you use speech recognition, screen reading, um, AI language translators, there's so many tools that are coming up that kind of allows you to be on one platform. So I think, again, to really narrow down an answer, I feel like whether it's the producers of technology that are consciously going to kind of create biases, that's going to happen irrelevant of technology. I think those who want to go against will always go against. But technology enhancements will now make it a playing field for majority. It's an interesting perspective. And the basis of bias is really ignorance, right? And what technology is doing is creating awareness. Exactly. And, you know, from the two-year-old kid onwards, mm. there's Absolutely. so much that you can learn and become aware of uh, that would help you know, eliminate those biases, you know, to my previous point about non-binary. My kids are talking about non-binary all the time and I, I learn from them. <laughs> right? And this would never have happened without. And so when it comes to the workplace also now people, you know, obviously they, even if they want to learn something, you don't have to wait for someone to teach you. You can Google it or YouTube it and you, you know, you can eliminate your own biases in that sense. Actually, just adding on to that point about how technology decreases the gender diversity. So the key thing is, yeah, we, technology can actually decrease it if you use it properly again. Like you've got to really understand what you want to do in which area using technology to decrease it. It has to be mindfully done. You still need a human mind who understands. I mean, if there is unconscious bias at that point of mm. putting that together, then you lost it. At the beginning, right? Yeah. So, Interesting. Yeah, yeah, so it has to be consciously uh, put together as to where are the issues, where are we having uh, diversity issues, what is really impacting, what do we need to do consciously coming up with it? Because anyway, any algorithm doesn't have unconscious bias, right? The algorithm is just going to run it. It can have unconscious bias if the algorithm is playing it because you're constantly now looking at a certain market, certain profile, certain this thing that is also biased. So you got to have that mindset at the beginning, very clear by the human beings for putting this whole thing together. Interesting. I think also the fact that you can also call out the human who has uh, by, you know, by in social media or anybody globally. It reminds me of a famous comedian from Hollywood who ca called out a minister here, not a minister, actually a member, ex-member of parliament for something he said. And then I, I, I think you, you all are aware, I don't, I don't want to mention names, but <laughs> it was fun. It was interesting to see how much people are watching and how much people can call out, um, you know, all sorts of uh, actions that en enhance uh, bias and increase, uh, you know, re re work to reduce di uh, diversity. Sanjeev, uh, from a very technical perspective, you, you, when you build products, do you consider gender? Or now with even your kids making a fair multitude of genders out there? It's a very interesting question. In fact, you know, uh, on first thought, it's, it sounds like a, a strange question, but if you really think deep into it, I think it, it's a multi-layered question. I think at the very basic level, you, you need to be aware of certain things like, for example, you know, in standard processes like, you know, know your customer, et cetera. You need to be conscious of what kind of questions you can ask. Uh, you, do, you don't want to be, again, unconsciously uh, offending someone. But, but that, I mean, that has been on, going on for a long period of time. What's happening now is something a little bit more different um, because... See, in, in the technology industry, we've been talking about users for, for decades and decades. And I guess over the last 20 years, we've been talking about actors as individuals who perform a certain role. Today, we're talking about personas. That's a huge shift. It's no longer about users or actors who are external entities. These are, like I said earlier, 360 degree personas who have different dimensions and gender very much is part of that. I wouldn't say it's gender specific. It's, it's very, very broad, but gender definitely plays a role in it. And every interaction, every journey, it's no longer a transaction. Now it's a journey. Yes. A journey has to be centered around a specific persona. And each persona has to have a different experience through that journey. The housewife going shopping from your previous example will be a very different journey to 
uh, a working husband going shopping or maybe a house husband going shopping mm-hmm. right Absolutely. so now all of those personas have come into the picture and you know all those gender considerations and various other considerations play an important role because that's how you differentiate your product or services from your competitors otherwise you are going to give you a, you know give your customers a plain vanilla offering that's that's going to be like me for It for the users today yeah, today exactly. is competitive environment interesting interesting um then i'm going to just uh, narrow down uh, the the workplace of the future um and it's very clear that it needs to be inclusive because i think uh, we're running out of time because for many reasons right there's huge competition there's migration there's this, uh, a disenchantment uh, also in the workplace um how can we create a inclusive workplace can technology help yeah actually i think the previous answer kind of feeds into it right uh, because what do you mean by inclusive um, inclusivity goes beyond gender it goes across you know abilities it goes across nationalities it goes across our gender um and actually belief systems as well right and i think number one there is biasness <laughs> whether it's conscious or unconscious and i think i i love her point uh you know you can bring technology but technology has a bias as well yes. right every <laughs> algorithm forget inclusivity you take a demand planning algorithm mm. that has multiple biases <laughs> unless you go back every 6 months every year and kind of fine tune and understand your outliers understand you know cleansing of your data understanding your trends if you don't do that then it doesn't matter what technology is available you you're not going to take your biasness out so i think absolutely fair point so if you feel that technology is going to play a vital part in kind of creating that inclusivity when it comes to taking the biases out i think it still is very human dependent because there is that influence on technology by humans and that's that's a very fair point um in terms of inclusivity across i think i mentioned it before right the the speech recognition i actually it was funny recently um most of our suppliers are from china right and you know the language barrier and it is hilarious when you try and have a conversation with them for longer than half an hour it it's it's uh, entertaining and then when you use one of those you know voice translators it feels very um it's not personal enough right you feel quite distant and it's like a robot talking to them so i had one of the guys in the team suddenly come back i came back from i think paper world in germany and they said oh you know they mean we've cracked this really cool thing they love it i was like okay and i see this life size man image coming up right it's it's my buyer and he's speaking in chinese and his body language is also a replica of how a chinese would speak that's technology for you now what does that do it suddenly you know completely brings you closer to your supplier now you've taken away that gap that prevented you from connecting that prevented you from understanding each other i mean that's a simple example but i think that's the start of a revolution right absolutely no more is there going to be an issue with language no more is there going to be an issue with geography of where you are mm. we've been using teams right or zoom or whatever these um that allows us to have remote meetings but imagine when ar and vr really kick up absolutely then your remote working is actually physical remote working absolutely. right it's not even just just conversations because then it just completely changes the game having said that i think i spoke to you about this earlier you know when shifting of behaviors that happens i told you this story uh we took the girls to disneyland recently and we be paid extra to use the genie you know the fast lane because you know it makes life so much easier and when we go there i realized that that entire genie fast lane is dependent on you booking your rides on an app right so you have your disney app and like that's great that's that's really nice technology is being used i was really happy you go to your app and you book and you're like oh okay wait i have to now watch the app consistently like you're watching the stock market to see which ride is available and as soon as it becomes available you need to flag it and then there's a two hour gap so many rules and regulations right what's the result you bring your kids to disneyland literally you take a step back and you look around you have every adult glued to a phone walking around a the theme park and your kids are just being dragged on the side right so i mean is it making everyone included is it inclusivity just because we've had technology now yeah it allows anyone to do whatever right and if you have a disability you can go ahead but even if you are you know differently able you still need to kind of depend on technology to a great extent that kind of takes away the magic 
of why you're there. So I think I go back to the initial line. I said it's a very thin line. And I think it all depends on how we interpret it and how we use it. And I really hope that, you know, the ethics, the, the culture that we kind of take forward dictates where we take technology. <laughs> So then I think there are a lot of conversations around that. So yeah, <laughs> hopefully, you know, uh, and there are loud voices, uh, you know, coming in from different parts. Um, final question to you, Chandi. Um, we discussed very interesting, you know, uh, behavioral changes that are brought by technology. What does it mean for women in the workforce? Um, you know, what what needs to change uh, from their own perspective? What needs to change from a societal perspective? What needs to change from an employer perspective to make sure that we fully optimize the outcomes? by using technology? So that's a very long answer <laughs> I have, and I know I don't have so much time, but uh, very at a very high level, few points on that is one, um, technology definitely helps women in the workplace because what we discussed earlier, access to information, transparent processes, it gives the ability for anyone who comes in, man or a woman, to be able to perform, assuming there's no unconscious biases and all that in the workplace, right? That's cost causing them not to. Um, so that being there, I think the main advice is um, there will be organizations who are a little far ahead in having these systems, having these processes in place, having the unconscious biases decreased in their different processes that we have in the high to retire, which will welcome more women to be successful and to go up the ladder. So that's where ultimate success is, not just coming in, but growing up the ladder and how many do you have at the different levels in the company. Um, whilst that is there, I think it's also important for companies to look at where are the women getting disengaged? Is it at the entry level? Is it uh, after maternity? Is it after a certain time? And to make and to understand no matter what technology, uh, algorithms and data analytics that you do, what areas do you think that you need to fo focus on? If it is on maternity moms, let's do a program in that. You can use analytics to understand, is it really there on somewhere else? Because you can, you know, read your, you know, other assessments or surveys that you do and look at algorithms and understand it. But have like a focus on where do you really want to go in your company? What works for you? Why are, why are the women leaving? And do programs around it to make sure that they get engaged to the company and they can have career progression. Most important thing for me is for women to look at their career and be have 100% clarity that um, they have to include themselves. Um, not wait for an organization to have these systems and have these processes and all of that, which I think the company should be working on anyway, but as individuals, to make sure that they include themselves. So that's a lot of work that you need to do as a woman uh, to know how you build confidence in your own abilities and to know that it's okay if you're not and to you know progress as an individual to include yourself slowly, constantly, working hard, pushing it, becoming uncomfortable. That's my advice because individuals make that difference end of the day. You can have all the systems, processes, Absolutely. algorithms. I want to add to that point. I think gender blind is the only way to go for females. You know, being in male dominant industries for 15 years, the actually was much easier to be a female and manage when you are gender blind. There is no discrimination if you don't allow it to be there. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I've, it's been a fascinating chat. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, um, when we started off, uh, I was very worried on how this conversation would go. But at the end of it, I think we have a lot of clarity, you know, in terms of what decisive actions need to be taken um, and by whom. Um, and, and a lot of that is actually in the hands of the individual. So thank you, uh, Chandi Dilmini and uh, Sanjeev for your time. And uh, uh, this is Sea Slays by Chilon. And we, today we discuss how technology affects human behavior.
non binary genders are now accepted in in gen z i would have imagined that it 